Hello everyone, how are you all doing? I hope you are all okay and are already fully vaccinated. As promised, this is a video on our course, Public Policy and Program Administration. So again, I would like to thank each and every one of you for participating in our first video relative to our course, Public Policy and Program Administration, which video was actually focused on the reasons why the need to study public policy. So this presentation, this outline was supposed to be presented to you via Google Meet, but unfortunately, some of you or almost almost all of you are not available for the Google Meet. So anyway, this is the outline, introduction, public policy, then critical reflections, and then types of public policies. And then I also added the principles of sound public policy as requested by some of you. And also, I already added in this lecture or this presentation about uh, distinguishing or there's this distinction between projects programs and policy so for the introduction we already know this one book that i already forwarded to you so she they actually got this quotation from the movie crimson tide movie in 1995 wherein captain frank ramsey said that we're here to preserve democracy and not to practice it so this is the introduction. So in the introduction, we have this picture on the citizens who would vote for the political leaders of their country or state. Um, these citizens are the ones who would, uh, again, put their political leaders to whom they would forward their interests or concerns. And the political leaders, the politicians, are the ones who would represent the citizens' interests they are the ones who would lobby for them in the legislature, for example, in Congress, in the Senate. And the politicians are the ones who would formulate laws or policies with regard to the interests of the citizens who voted for them. And whatever would be the law or the policy that the politician has crafted for the citizens would be eventually be in the hands of the bureaucrats. And the bureaucrats or those in government agencies they are the ones who would implement the policies and then the this would be monitored whatever would be the implementation of our bureaucrats or our government servants they would be monitored through a feedback mechanism it would go then to the citizens who would be also part of those people who would evaluate the actions of our government servants our government and then the cycle would go on but in reality, public policy process rarely follows this orderly pattern, which I showed you earlier, this one. Because sometimes there would be some instances that from the citizens, instead of soliciting or um, having this consultation with the uh, citizens or the, the constituents, politicians would craft their own laws or policies based on their agenda and then they would be this would then be translated to some sort of policies by the government agencies so that's why we don't have this orderly pattern as usual or at all times so what then is policy so there's this definition of policy policy not public policy when you talk of policy it refers to laws regulation procedure administrative action incentive voluntary practice of governments and other institutions so by other institutions this was already shown in the video that we had collaborated on we are referring to those private institutions or companies they also are they also have their own sets of policies for their own benefit or for the benefit of their company or their people so why do we study public policy each one of you already gave their insights on this so how relevant is it to our daily lives so we have here some reasons why we need to study public policy because we are affected by the action or inaction of the government just in imagine our government not exec, uh, enforcing traffic laws there would be chaos in our traffic there would be traffic jams all over and then all of us would be late in going to school or going to work or they would not uh, that we really would not have these garbage collectors who would collect our garbages or our trash every day then we would have these rats or sm really bad or foul smell all over 
if you don't have these garbage collectors who would be doing their daily jobs or weekly jobs to collect our garbages. So just imagine that one. Imagine the inaction of the government. So we would have uh, chaos, we would have problems. And then another reason is for scientific inquiry. It's for us to understand the factors that affect government's decision making. So we are talking of the behavior of political and policy actors. They are the ones who would give some advice, or uh, I mean, give insights, okay? So these are actually people, the learned ones, who would craft, for example, theories relative to public policy. So, so that our decision makers would have a clear understanding on where they are going. So they have, uh, they have the basis, the basis, a theoretical basis, for example, conceptual basis for their decisions, so for scientific inquiry. And another reason is for the development of professional expertise because our leaders, political leaders, they may be expert in their field. For example, they are economists, like in the case of Gloria, a former president, Gloria, she was an economist. And she was great in doing so as an economist, but she still needed political advisors for her to understand the terrain, for example, the, the political terrain in our country because our the politics here, especially in the Philippines, is very dynamic. Sometimes the political leaders would be with you, they would favor you, but then later on they would they would do things, terrible things, that would be detrimental to the to the government, for example, they would um, make some issues, political issues, they would hype it up, and uh, everybody would be disturbed. So that's why we need this professional expertise or experts in the field of public policy so that those leaders, political leaders, would have a clear uh, understanding and then they would be able to craft public policies that would really answer or resolve public concerns. So we need these skilled public policy analysts. And then we have here the concepts and definitions which we also tackled in the first video. So we have here political scientists concepts or definitions on public policy. The first here is Thomas Dye. He said that when we talk of public policy it refers to what government does or does not do. Okay, so for him it's the choice of the government to make such decision to act on that decision or not. And for Dai, for him, the agent of policy making is actually the government. For Carl Friedrich, for example, okay, we have here concept of Carl Friedrich. He said that it refers to proposed course of action pursued by the actor. And when we talk of actor, we are referring to persons, to groups, to the government, government itself, to realize specific goals within an environmental context or in a particular uh, in a particular area context where in this particular environmental area or context there are obstacles and uh, opportunities these obstacles and opportunities are there they coexist that's why when we do action planning we have this SWOT analysis for example so that we can arrive at a particular formidable action plan to answer or resolve a particular issue. So for SWOT, it stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Opportunities, of course, we have the opportunities, those things that are, that are not internal to the agency, for example, or to the LG, for example, but are available and can be tapped by the agency so that they can reinforce or they, these opportunities uh, can be tapped or can be accessed by the LGU or the NGA, National Government Agency, to forward the interest of the people. And then we have the threats. What are those that are external, outside of the control of the, of the LGU or the NGA, for example, but these threats are the ones that they should make some action plan so that they, this won't harm or they uh, with this would be won't be a barrier for the opportunities of the LGO or the NGAs, for example. And then for Jenkins, he's also a political scientist who said that it's actually goal oriented when we talk of public policy. So just read on this one, and we already tackled on this. Anderson also he's the one who focused on the final decision instead of those decisions that were actually. Um, 
uh, contributed by political actors or groups and uh, he is also focused on the final decision towards the crafting of the public policy and then Hicklow for him when you talk of public policy it's a long series of related activities and policy for him is something bigger than particular decisions for Jenkins again he is the one who introduced the standard in public policy evaluation because when we talk of public policy this must be evaluated according to him this must be evaluated at all costs it must be evaluated so that there could be some amendments to such public policy if necessary but of course I already I already invited you to watch the videos of Professor Birkeland so he's the one who have this book on in the introductory book on public policy so for Professor Birkeland he said that when we talk of public policy it is actually made in public's name of course there's the word public that's why it's called uh, public policy it's made in public's name public interest it's not for private interest and it is made by the government because if the policy is not made by the government it is only private policy like for example in the case of companies private companies they have their own sets of policies if it's them for example URC Universal Rabina Corporation they have they their sets of policies or they have their own set of policies so their policies even if it affects the public for example in entrance and the entrance of their of their area of work for example even if it actually affects many people if it's not made by the government then those sets of policies are only private policies then public policy is interpreted and implemented by public and private actors so an example of this concept or definition on public policy is that when we talk of airline industry for example the legislature are the ones uh, the legislature enacted laws relative to the airline industry how to regulate the airline industry for example and then we have the CAAP as well as the OT or the Department of Transportation uh, they are the OTR they are the ones who would regulate private airline companies uh, through policies so they craft their policies relative that are in accordance with the laws that were our Senate as well as our Congress congressmen so those policies are actually crafted by the government or enacted by the government but are implemented by private actors and who are the private actors here they are the private airline companies like Philippine Airlines Cebu Pacific etc they are actually the ones who have this policy on uh, for example non no smoking inside aircraft so it's even if uh, it is being implemented by the private airline company it is actually there's actually a law on that particular policy so that's why we have here interpreted and implemented by public and private actors and also we have this definition or concept again by Thomas Dye government intends to do so this is in the active form and it also refers to what government chooses not to do so this is in the passive form this is for the maintenance of status quo so public policy critical reflections so when you talk of public policy when we study public policy we have these critical reflections on the political system because there is a big difference between liberal democracies and non-democratic regimes in liberal democracies we are we are talking of the citizens the citizenry who vote the political leaders or they are the ones who put into office the political leaders so they have a great weight they have a big bearing if you can call it that way in the crafting of public policies and even laws the citizens in liberal democracies that's why we have this legal maxim salus populi es suprema lex the voice of the people is the supreme law when we talk of liberal democracies or free states but in non-democratic regimes this is not the case in non-democratic regimes it's actually the political leaders that are actually are most often than not military in military regimes they are the ones who craft their own policies sans or even without 
the consultation of the people. As long as whatever they deem fit, whatever they feel or they see that is uh, beneficial to their people, they just enact it on their own without, the consult without consulting the people. That's for non-democratic regimes. So the role of the government and non-state actors are very important when we talk of public policy. So in non-democratic regimes, what is important is power. When we talk of power, this actually refers to the ability to enforce one's will on the other because they just impose their will on the people. They don't, they don't care if the people acknowledge their power, the power of those who are in the authority. But in liberal democracies, power and authority are very important because authority refers to the legitimate use of power which is the ability to enforce one's will on the other so the two these two concepts power and authority are very important in liberal democracies when they try to craft or make up or decide on a particular public policy Another critical reflection is the study of public policy. When you talk of public policy as a study, this is actually a course that is multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary because we draw upon other disciplines like political science because there's power playing. When you talk of power, political science, we are actually studying power playing here. And then economics, okay, sociology, and then psychology, history. These are very important in the study of public policy, without which you would not be able to understand and you would not be able to come up with a coherent and sound public policy. Another critical reflection is the study and practice of public policy, which is actually on the definition of Thomas Dye, what government does and chooses not to do. So it includes political analysis of state and non-state actors. The interplay of these two, the state and non-state actors. So, when we talk of this one, you are talking of applying it, applying what you have learned in the course of public policy. That's why it is an applied science. So, we have here critical reflections on public policy. It is strengthened with when it efficiently solves the various issues and problems prevalent in the state. It is designed to support and serve governmental organizations and nations and policies. It encourages an active uh, citizenship to all to develop the integrity and liberty of the country. Also, it emphasizes the decisions that boost the political system outputs, including transport strategies, administration, and management of an institution, and is mainly concerned about, about evaluating the decision-making power of public bureaucracies and governments because it is very important to evaluate public policy because what would be the outcome or the output of such of enforcing or implementing public policies. If you're not going to evaluate it, then it just end there. It would just die there. Okay? There would be no improvement in the political in the political system or in the political democracies. So this final reflection on uh, political uh, public policy is that it is an intended and collective course of action taken by government which has power and or authority to make decision among competing interests because we have different peoples from different areas of a state or country for example and they have different interests they are fighting for or they are trying to forward their own interests so the government's role then is to consolidate all of these interests into one so they would come up with a coherent and sound public policy that would address the issue of the uh, the greater good of the people or the greater good of the people so this is beneficial for the society so we have here the types of public policy so first is distributive public policy so what is distributive public policy when we talk of distributive public policy it actually refers to render goods render goods and services to the members of an institution or an organization and it also refers to distribute the costs among the members it also encompasses all public welfare and assistance program 
So, what are those assistance program? Public welfare assistance programs. We have for adult education program, for example, food relief, social insurance, or vaccination, for example, now that we have this pandemic, public distribution systems. These are all examples of distributive public policy. Regulatory public policy. What is this? This actually refers to practices involved with public policy that is striving to regulate and control multi -economic, multiple economic sectors of the state or the concerned institutions. So when you talk of regulatory, it is concerned with the regulation of the business, trade, safety measures, public utilities and others, independent institutions or organizations that do it on behalf of the government. So what are those institutions that are not governmental, okay, but they are actually servicing the people or serving the people on behalf of the government. So we have the uh, Kagen de Oro Water District, for example, the, uh, what else? We have the Sepalco, Moresco Uno. So these are private entities that are for, they are actually serving the people, the public. They are serving the public, but for profit and on behalf of the government. So redistributive public policy. So what is this? This refers to those that are associated with rearrangement of policies that is concerned with bringing about specific changes in the economic and social status of the state or the institution. So what are the examples? We have here certain assets, for example, and benefits divided disproportionately among certain segments of the society. So there is an example of redistributive public policy is when they impose progressive taxation system. So this is based on the public policy which indicates that those who make more money should pay more money into the system and those who have less money should pay less into the system. The idea is that those who earn the most money should make a higher contribution to help fund programs and for those who earn very little should not be taxed more. Okay, So the taxation rate for those who earn less or earn very little would be almost nil. For those who earn much, would be they would be taxed more. That's why we have progressive taxation system here in the Philippines. Another, another example for redistributive public policies, when income tax is structured such that the tax rates are lowered for those corporations and wealthy individuals. But there is this belief that if those in the position to create jobs would pay less tax, then they'll increase wages or hire more workers. But these corporations are actually, they need not pay the kind of tax that we thought they should pay. But they are of this, um, this CSR, social responsibility. So they give uh, charity, they give uh, for institutions, educational institutions. So instead of paying taxes directly to the BAR, for example, they divert this one and they would create more jobs for those who are uh, differently able individuals, for example. So they give, they make jobs for them, even if they don't have the, let's say, they are not that high achievers. So the the belief is that again, those in the position to create jobs pay less tax, so that they increase wages. But again, these people, these wealthy people that are not taxed more despite their earnings they're not taxed more they are actually monitored by our government substantive public policy so what is this substantive public policy it focuses on the sectors of the society or economy that are affected by various public policies like educational policies Agri policies, agricultural policies, urban policies, health policies, defense policies, etc. So, this actually cannot, uh, does not cater to any particular or privileged section of the society. They have to be formulated dynamically, keeping in mind the goals and characteristics of the constitution, so the organic law of the act of the country, and the directive principles of state policy. So. 
These are policies concerned with the general welfare and development of the society like provision of education and employment opportunities, economic stabilization, law and order enforcement, anti-pollution laws, for example, katong the RA9003, so Clean Air Act, etc. These are examples of substantive public policy. Capitalization. So what is this capitalization? These policies are actually related to financial subsidies given by the state for those to the national government to the state to local governments then and the central and state business undertakings and it is not directly linked to public welfare as others listed earlier so those the redistributive public policy distributive so they're not listed so this is not the type of public policy it contribute indirectly but basically infrastructural and development policies for government business organizations to keep functioning properly that's why we have uh, for our roads the build 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 okay this is to subsidize also our local and uh, governments local and state governments that's why we have our governments uh, our local governments LGUs when they example they would propose a project for their area road widening or they have this road infra projects they would ask for budget from the central government and then the central government depending on the approval of their project a project proposal and depending on the approval they would subsidize or give budget to the local governments so that the local governments would be able to implement such infra projects constituent public policy what is this so constituent public policy deals with laws and it creates executive power entities it deals with fiscal policies under certain circumstances so new institutions or mechanisms for public welfare so that is constituent public policy there's a difference actually between the terms policy and law so when you talk of policy it outlines what a government is going to do and what it can achieve for the society as a whole. For law, this actually refers to set of standards, principles, and procedures that must be followed in the society. Dura lex sed lex. The law may be harsh, but it is the law. So all of the citizens in the Philippines, for example, have no choice but to follow the law. These are sets of standards, principles, and procedures that we have to follow at all costs. Law. Policy, it just outlines what a government is going to do and what it can achieve for the society as a whole. Basically, it's just a mere document which has this outline. Policy means what a government does not and intend to do. That's why we have Thomas Dye's definition. Public policy is what government does or does not do. Law is mainly made for implementing justice. So the, the very goal of law is to the implementation or administration of justice in the society. Policy evolves the principles that are needed for achieving the goal. Those steps that are needed to achieve the goal are actually in this document policy. These are documents and not law but can lead to new laws because uh, whatever could be the basis of these policies, what, whatever would be the outcome, for example, I mean, of these policies, this would be the very basis for the legislature to enact or to pass another law relative to that part of policy, for example. So various types of laws framed like criminal law, civil law, and international laws, etc. So policy are made in the name of the people, but law are for the people. Made in the name of the people, policy. For are for the people, law. Policy can be called a set of rules that guide any government or any organization. Again, it actually guides. It guides the government. It guides any organization to do something. Policy. When you talk of law, these are enforceable, in which all policies must comply. Okay. And then policy is informal as it is just a statement. Again, it's a document. Keyword document of what is intended to be done in the future. But law 
these are more formal because it is a system of rules and guidelines that are derived for the welfare and equity in the society. So always remember this distinction between policy and law. So what is this public policy cycle? So these are the features of the public policy cycle. There's this deliberate plan of action to guide decisions and achieve rational outcomes. And it is determined by the politicians. Public policy is determined by politicians. Influenced by stakeholders and interest groups. And it has no predetermined shape. No predetermined shape because it, it is very dynamic. And the budget, objective, rules, time, horizon are also not predetermined. So we have this cycle. First is you need to assess what is the uh, what are the needs, I mean, of the society, my my municipality, for example. So there's this needs assessment. After the public officials or leaders are done with this part, needs assessment, they now proceed to public policy formulation. So there are several steps that you have to do this under public uh, policy formulation. Once they have already come up or formulated a concrete public policy, the same would now be implemented by the local government units, for example, or our leaders, political leaders, or even our national government agencies. After they implement such public policy, then comes the monitoring. They, these public policies would be monitored and later on would be evaluated by our citizens, for example, and this is called feedback and the cycle would go on so this is the public policy cycle what are then the policy delivery tools so the policy delivery tools are as follows we have laws taxes goods and services this is this actually fall under program governing and suasion so what is this governing and suasion suasion it's actually referred to as influence especially from government organizations governing and suasion so what is the influence from government organizations that is used to persuade a certain group so we have organization and doing nothing so let's take this policy relative to education educational policy so what are the things that we have to consider we have services we have laws and then under services we look at schools we look at universities and when we talk of law for example there's this compulsory attendance attendance of the students for 20 weeks straight so this is an example of uh, policy delivery tools so we have make this um, frame or we have this uh, tree for example problem tree that you have to come up with in order for you to arrive at particular public policy program so let's define program so program is a policy delivery tool to provide goods and services Procedures are well defined, so we have the air in the program. You define there the management, monitoring team, for example, control, evaluation. What are the things uh, that you use in monitoring for to control, evaluation? And then we have here budget under program. Timing and target population are also defined under program. And specific, no specific beneficiary is identified because we are talking of the public at large. So this is the program document structure. Description of the current situation, strategy and priorities, financial tables, partnership, implementing provisions or the laws. The provisions or those particular articles, for example, or sections of the law, implementing provis provisions for this particular program. So let's see a sample program of the Philippine government. We can access this under the official gazette of the government of the Republic of the Philippines. So programs and policies we have here, social contract with the Filipino, Filipino people under executive, pursuant to executive order number 43, series of 2011, still under President Benigno S. Aquino III. So this is the law. Let's try to check here. So executive order number 43. So this is reorganization of the cabinet cluster. So we're assets. There, so key result areas of their social contracts. So there is the KRA, key result area, okay, of the social contract. Organizing of cabinet clusters. So here are the provisions under this particular law. So this is the structure then in reorganizing the cabinet clusters under the office of the president. So this is the chair, the president, then secretaries, 
and then secretarial. So, human development and poverty reduction, just read this one during your spare time. So, another, another program of the government, say, under economic development, the PPP, the three P's, public-private partnership. So, under the PPP, three P's, public-private partnership, here, so we have here, for example, media release, Iloilo for Iloilo City, they have this consultation for the city slaughterhouse PP, under the PPP project. So government, the government provides budget for this particular program, the public-private partnership, for example. And then let's check another one. Under security, justice, and peace, we have the Pamana program. So, for example, in, under the Department of Agriculture, they still implement Pamana program, okay? Pamana.net But you can check the Pamana program. So we have there the, the rice program under Pamana, the road program, in, uh, FMR program under the Pamana program. Then climate change, they have NOAA, Project NOAA, if you heard of this one. Mm -hmm. So this is under the DOST. DOST's response to the call of President Aquino for more accurate, integrated, and responsive Disaster prevention and mitigation system, especially in high-risk areas throughout the Philippines because we already know that there are flooded areas in the country and every time we have strong typhoons or strong typhoons would hit our country, our air, there are several areas in our country that would be truly devastated by the typhoons. Many would be homeless. Many people, it would also take several lives or hundreds of lives. So they come up, the government came up with this Project NOAA, so Nationwide Operational Assessment of Hazards, so that they can immediately give response to our, our Kababayans or Filipinos in time of distress or disasters. For project, what is it? It is actually integrated in a specific policy and is part of a program. So. Here's a program. Under program, we have project. That's why pro pro program on risk, de uh, risk deduction, reduction, for example, is Project NOAA, if you want it that way. And then, and then we have here set of ex ante. Or when you say ex ante, these are actually not of the moment. Okay? These are actually based on forecasts rather than actual results. So when you talk of project, it has its own it has its own specific objectives linked to program and policy strategies. So a project has sharp costs, identified beneficiaries. As compared to program, it has no identified beneficiaries. See here, no specific beneficiary. But for project, you have specific and identified beneficiaries. And there's this timing and output or outcomes. Okay. So there's the difference between program and project. In program... Timing and target population are defined, but no specific beneficiary. But in project, so identified beneficiaries project. So sample project or sample government projects. So we have here sample of a government projects of our government projects under this site. Okay, why is it not working? Here, we have here the diesel plant one project in Iligan City. So this project involves the design, supply, delivery, installation, erection, including civil works, testing, commissioning of a diesel generating power station. We have Agos 3 hydroelectric plant. This is another project. More often than that, if you look at the projects under the office of the president, it's more on infra projects, also this one. Okay, the for power plants, even uh, there's this move to uh, revitalize or to open up again, open up the nuclear plant in Bataan. Okay, to address our electric concern. Okay, just read that particular site for the projects, government projects. So, what is the project life cycle? So we have these different phases of the project life cycle. First is you will need this identification, formulation, implementation, and evaluation. Almost the same 
as the policy life cycle only that only that um, in this part here okay if you look at the policy cycle here where's that in the policy cycle you have here needs assessment but instead of needs assessment they put in there in project life cycle they place in their identification identification of the project here so identification so then they make some formulation then implement the project and then evaluate the project approach is more on problem solving almost the same as the policy life cycle so this is the policy map if you look at the policy map you have here policy and under policy you have program fiscal measures law organization and then up below the program are the projects so sample philippine government policies we look at this one on health so let's proceed to this one because the neda link is not working so we have here health related policies so the philippine plan of action for nutrition ppan 2017 to 2022 so it would end next year so you can access this file in the world health organization website extranet so here you have here okay this is how the policy looks like so it's actually a document basically just a document okay so now let's proceed to the principles of strong public policy there are actually seven principles of strong public policy as laid down by mr reed according to him Principle number one states that free people are not equal and equal people are not free. What do we mean by this? When people are free to be themselves, to be masters of their own destinies, to apply themselves in an effort to improve their well-being and that of their families, the result in the marketplace will not be an equality of outcomes. Just think of the difference between those who are wealthy in terms of wealth, in terms of talent, our willingness to work, and savings. Because... Free people are not equal. So in under democracies, for example, no matter how hard we try to be, to think that we tr would try our best to be equal in a free state, this cannot be achieved. This cannot be, this cannot be so because there are still some people who are very rich, who are very wealthy, while there are very poor people. Like in, this, in our case, in the Philippines, we see this extreme extreme picture of wealthy people for example the marco says they are very wealthy and then when we look around we have these very poor people i'm not saying that because of the marco says we have poor people because i am actually pro pbbm no it's just that this is the reality that no matter what we do in a free state because we are allowed to do things like look for jobs and to excel there's always these instances of disparity between the rich and the poor even if we are in a free state we are free people we are no longer slaves but we are not equal and also equal people are not free okay those people who are of the same wealth for example okay it's so nice to to think that they are equal in terms of wealth in terms of talent in terms of work privileges but they are not free let's just look at those communist states they're equal they have the same the same wealth for example because they are regulated by the government but they are not free they cannot access the internet at all times they, their internet access are is actually restricted they cannot just post anything on Facebook. When you go to China, for example, you cannot just simply post anything that you want on Facebook. In fact, there's limited access to the internet in China. That's why if you look at our Facebook, those Chinese that would post things on Facebook are mostly about their lifestyle, about the good things. Because they say that in China, there, there is this so-called, they are actually censored. They are actually censored 
and which which we Filipinos do not want to happen to our country. We don't want to be censored at all times. We want to have this freedom. So we have this principle that free people are not equal because when we have everything, we ha when we are free to do things, we can we have this disparity between the rich and the poor and those people who just tend to be lazy and those people who would do or do extra mile. So we have this two sets of people, total opposites in a free country. So depending on our behavior towards work, towards um, saving, for example. That's why we have this first principle of strong public policy. Second principle of strong public policy is what belongs to you, you tend to ca take care of, and what belongs to no one or everyone tends to fall into despair. This is actually true. Why? When you are given, for example, it's like, let's just say in government projects, for example, or government programs. I was with the government for almost, uh, it, the, the Department of Trade and Industry for almost 10 years. And when we have projects wherein we give dole out or grant to our, to our uh, clientele, for example, like those in remote areas under the CARP or the Comprehensive Agrarian Reform Program, we realized or we noticed that the beneficiaries, they don't really care. They don't give any value to the projects of the government. They come up with these proposals for projects called, when we call for proposals. They, they submit all of these proposals wherein the projects have this very high costs, no? The project costs are actually high, but when we already deliver the project to them or turn over the project to them, they would not take care of the project anymore. Because for them, this is from the government. This is just dole out. This is just grant. We don't really care. We do, they don't give it any worth because it belongs to everyone. That project is a CSF or the Common Service Facility. But what belongs to you, for example, because you, it is actually your hard-earned money, you tend to take care of it, even risk your life, just to protect your property or your earnings, right? So this is the principle, second principle that we are talking here. The third principle states that sound policy requires that we consider long-run effects and all people not simply run short run effects and a few people so this is like this is a, actually a tongue tie twister a call to be thorough in our thinking it says that we shouldn't be superficial in our judgments we should look at the long term effects of our public policy if we are political leaders if we are the ones who would craft or make such decisions for our citizens for example because there would be Maybe in the future, some of you would become political leaders. In fact, we have a political person here. We have our very own Mr. Pileno as a counselor. So when you make up or when you make legislation or when you make ordinance, for example, you look at the long-term effect of such resolution or even po policy. Why? Because it's not just for the this particular moment that you're making such public policy it is for the future even if you're no longer in office those who would be your successor they would be able to use your public policy that's why before you make such public policy you have to make sure that it is sound and it would benefit your constituents and not just a few people or segment in your society the fourth principle is, if you encourage something, you get more of it. If you discourage something, you get less of it. Just think of incentives and disincentives. For example, there's this uh, curtail spending if you want to stimulate a weak economy so it will produce more jobs and more revenue. When the patient is ill, the doctor doesn't bleed him. So if you encourage something, if you encourage someone to do this particular action, you would be getting more of from that particular action but if you discourage someone to do that action then you would no longer get that particular action for example let's just say 
you would encourage someone to in your society in your in your community to to uh, make up this cleanup drive so when you do that you encourage other people in your community to have this cleanup drive every weekend you would get more people for you would get some kind of action like that in your community because you're you're doing everything you can to encourage others to do that but if you discourage for example people you'd say you'd tell them oh, don't do that cleanup drive anymore because you are wasting wasting your effort or because there's this pandemic you are causing or you would be the carrier of the disease so no other people there would be less people who do such cleanup drive in your community fifth principle is nobody spends somebody else's money as carefully as he spends his own so this is almost related to the to the third principle i mean the second principle i mean what belongs to you you tend to take care of nobody spends somebody else's money as carefully as he spends his own so just think about it somebody spending somebody else's money on yet somebody else so when you have this money which you don't you don't really own you spend it lock in luxurious luxurious materials for example or you just spend it really not really wisely you just spend it you know extravagant you just spend it as how you make it a dim it fit you don't really care if the if the product or the good that you bought for that particular money would serve its purpose but if you're talking of your money before you spend your money for example you think so hard before you spend it especially if you have less of it if you have less money you spend so much on thinking what would be the cost uh, the, the the cons and the pros in spending your money the sixth principle states that government has nothing to give anybody except what it first takes from somebody and a government that's big enough to give you everything you want is big enough to take away everything you've got so this is actually on a free and de independent people do not look government to look do not look to government for sustenance they see government not as a fountain of free goodies but rather as a protector of their liberties confined to certain minimal functions that revolve around keeping in the peace keeping the peace maximizing everyone's opportunities and otherwise leaving us alone so for example uh, we just give this example or, or illustration so since the government is so big that it would give you the liberties that you want the freedom that you would like to enjoy okay the freedom that we are trying to protect freedom of, of expression etc but if you violate laws for example relative relative to your freedom of expression because it's not absolute then the liberty the freedom that you have been enjoying could be cut off by the government and you would even be imprisoned so the government is that entity that is so big to give you everything your freedom for example but it is also the very entity that may take away your freedom should you violate any law related to the freedom of expression which you violated then the seventh principle is liberty makes all the difference in the world liberty isn't just a luxury or a nice idea it's much more than a happy circumstance or defensible everyday concept it's what make us it's what makes us just about everything else happen without liberty life would be a bore and worse there is no life at all says mr reed also he said that public policy that dismisses liberty or doesn't preserve preserve or strengthen liberty should be immediately suspect in the minds of a vigilant people they should be asking what are we getting in return if we're being asked if we're being asked to give up some of our freedom so that would be the end of the presentation ladies and gentlemen on public policy so if you have some question please leave a comment below or post a comment in our google classroom under the stream which uh, have this attachment thank you very much and god bless you